Well, well. Now Juha is, is coming. Juha Hassel, principal scientist from VTT. And same time, I'm a little bit thinking that uh, we started nine o'clock and uh, uh, with no breaks. And uh, break the yes, that's the plan. So I'm a little bit looking at your faces that you are still <laughs> smiling and uh, can sit down. But if needed, just stand up and relax your back and sit down back because you have Hassel, he will give a talk uh, about superconductivity for quantum technologies. Juha comes from VTT and uh, this is a good piece of the cake today, please. Okay, thank you. Okay, please Juha, and now a little bit more quiet, please. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Mikko, Mikko was talking a lot about, uh, about quantum computer in general and uh, uh, now uh, the one of the platforms indeed is the superconducting quantum computer and uh, 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 I'm now trying to give a little bit on the background of the superconducting uh, integrated circuit technology and superconductor technology in general to, to see maybe a little bit of this technological perspective of what it is what is the background how we wh why we are doing it here and uh, uh, also um, how we have come come to this situation that we are um, we are a a able to do these things so superconducting conductivity we have had something on cryogenics and something on the phenomena quantum phenomena but uh, in general superconducting as such is a quantum state of matter that has some strange properties. Most well known is that it has no DC uh, low frequency electrical resistivity, some unique magnetic uh, properties. Um, so it, it works at low temperatures. So as such, the low temperatures are, are uh, a useful thing. So you have low thermal fluctuations. You can do uh, very sensitive detectors, for example, and you can uh, have certain phenomena like these uh, quantum states with small energies that are not uh, uh, hidden by thermal fluctuations. So here's some, some temperature scales. So uh, this is not at all uh, complete. Very many materials, metals show um, and ceramics so show superconducting transitions at low enough temperatures. Here's some, some materials of uh, significance. Uh, the highest temperature where you can have uh, is this uh, yttrium barium copper oxide that go, goes around 93 Kelvin. There are some technological uh, applications in sensors uh, and maybe magnets. Uh, but uh, I would say that today most uh, end applications, technological end applications are working in this temperature range of 3 to 10 Kelvin. Uh, before it was like 4.2 Kelvin was common because that's the boiling point of liquid helium that was used to cool. In the days of dry cryos that is not so, so uh, strictly defined, but we have uh, these things that I, I'm showing something. We have neuromagnetic, we have some security. Uh, uh, screening applications and then magnetic resonance imaging which is uh, the most common but maybe a bit boring because it's just magnets that are, are cooled down so it's uh, it only uses this resistivity nothing and not not the mo more experimental then uh, De David also mentioned this uh, imaging system so astronomical imaging typically works on the sub Kelvin temperatures maybe uh, in the ballpark of 50 millikelvin to 500 uh, millikelvin and then of course the superconducting quantum computer where you you want to go as low as possible to to have these uh, quantum states alive so then um, what is a superconducting integrated circuit so i i looked from wikipedia and they told me that uh, integrated circuit is a set of electronic components or circuits on a small flat piece or of semiconductor material that is normally silicon. This is still valid uh, even if you are doing superconducting electronics or superconducting IC. So um, the basic structure is actually, the, the, well, there are a few structures, but the most common one is, is the so-called uh, superconducting tunnel junction or Josephson junction. Uh, so in a simple way, it's just two superconductors and a piece of something insulating, a couple of nanometers thick layer of insulating material. Most typically actually aluminum oxide in between. And uh, this is the basic building block of your superconducting integrated circuit. So basically it's sort of uh, inter interesting to think that uh, 
everything we do here, or at least a very large part, is just based on placing pieces of rusted aluminium on a piece of uh, silicon. And uh, from there on you get everything, for example, what Mikko was explaining earlier. So um, there are some microscope photographs of ICs that has a lot of um, uh, these uh, tunnel junctions. Uh, this, I think, is a magnetometer for brain imaging. So. So that's the way, okay, and then you have here a little bit more technological picture. So in reality, there are different ways of doing these structures, but in any case, you, you use your mi microfabrication techniques to have this uh, oxide between these two in metals that in this case are, are niobium and indeed this aluminum oxide, oxide in, in the middle. Um, okay, so coming from these pieces of rusted aluminum, it actually gives a really versatile uh, set of physics and dynamical phenomena which you can use, use in the circuit. So there, are, there were mentions about quantum 1.0 or quantum 2.0, so uh, a lot of these superconducting circuits are, are devices are made are somehow this quantum 1.0 so uh, they you use them as active circuit elements, uh, nonlinear elements in your integrated circuit. In some sense, similar similarly than you use transistors in a, in a computers. And it, there's uh, also this funny paradox. So here, here I have a, a classical model. If those of you who can do electrical engineering could easily probably uh, start playing around and do circuits with them, uh, simulate circuits with them. Uh, it's a classical thing, although paradoxically the variable of interest is this quantum phase difference across the junction, but it still behaves uh, classically. Then uh, when you start talking about quantum computing and things like that, you, you need to go into the limits where really these uh, uh, energy levels become separable. This is the quantum phase difference again, and uh, you start, if you solve this Hamiltonian function of the system, you start seeing these uh, discrete energy states and you can, for example, interpret that the two lowest ones are the zero and the one, and you can start building quantum computers. Uh, okay, it helps if you have a PhD in physics, but uh, uh, how to do it exactly, but the, it, it comes from there. So um, this is the technological background. A little bit like uh, here I'm, this is an overview of, of, of things that we are doing with superconducting ICs, quantum one, quantum two. So <coughs> the traditional topics are uh, magnetic sensors, like uh, looking at w w w uh, uh, detecting the neuronal signals of brain and using that in, uh, in um, uh, medicine or brain research. And then we have uh, astronomical imaging again is one. So one topic, we have these imaging systems for security. Um, all these are based on superconducting sensors that where the most important thing is to have this low temperature, low, low fluctuation to have the uh, noises down. And then uh, classical uh, electronics like this post CMOS that agreeably is, is uh, something that CMOS being developing, uh, at least has been developing so fast that uh, the competing techniques are, are there behind. Then the lower line is maybe more e either the quantum technology, of course the quantum uh, computer, uh, quantum bits uh, as such the, as the most purest. Then some uh, uh <coughs> enabling techniques like integrated microcoolers and thermometers also, and also this uh, some uh, amplifier components for the quantum state readout. Uh, a little bit like more end user perspective. So uh, if you think of medicine really, uh, these are also the early pioneering works since the 90s. There has been <coughs> commercial activity in, in Finnish companies nowadays called Megin, who is selling these uh, um, <coughs> uh, uh, magnetoencephalography systems, a sort of brain imaging method uh, using uh, superconducting quantum inf interference device technology originating from VTT. Actually, we have an audience today, Jari Pentila, who is commercializing the VTT's squid, squid products here. Uh, this is an early prototype from VTT in the security imaging, so you can s see what people are hiding under their clothes. Today, commercialized by spin-off company from uh, VTT and uh, Aalto uh, called Askella, uh, is selling this commercially. We are also involved in certain astronomical imaging uh, missions. So Mikko Kiviranta, also back there, in the, is, is 
leading on VTT side this um, Athena where we are doing superconducting electronics readout for this very sensitive uh, millikelvin uh, detectors in this case for x-rays and then uh, the quantum technology which I will be soon addressing a little bit in more detail. Um, okay so where, where do we get these uh, <coughs> superconducting ICs from here and the answer is of course from here or from the other end of the building which has the <coughs> largest clean room, clean room in, in in, <coughs> in Northern Europe has, uh, has this, uh, it's a shared facility between Aalto and VTT. You see some, some map there and uh, some photographs of what's happening in there. <coughs> and um, <coughs> uh, so we have uh, these different fabrication lines, fabrication platforms. Uh, obviously, one I the most relevant one here is uh, <coughs> superconducting tunnel junction devices. There's also, <coughs> I'm sorry, I'm, um, <coughs> yeah, so, um, so some other maybe worth mentioning is that we have also quite extensive silicon photonics, integrated photonics circuit uh, technology <coughs> that uh, may have some future um, uh, contributions to the quantum technology as well and uh, also ac active silicon devices like CMOS line more <coughs> more close to conventional semiconductor <coughs> industry but also some quantum aspects we are doing some more specialized <coughs> systems so there are some implications in the quantum technology as well so maybe something about our ways of operating so compared to uh, many university labs where the quantum stuff is today done, we are a little bit more, more industrial, but we still have this uh, sort of freedom to develop our fabrication processes uh, and even combine the different platforms in a creative way. So we have this capacity to go into commercialization and practically even within the same building. So there's this uh, subsidiary company, VTT MEMSFAB, which... Uh, has the capacity to do commercial small volumes production. So it's a big asset in, in, uh, in commercialization. So you don't need to move your fabrication process to somewhere else, which is uh, actually not so easy. But th then uh, if you go to very high volumes, then you go, go outside the building. And um, we have really now these uh, fabrication line, lines using based on 150 millimeter wafers, actually pending up upgrade to 200 millimeters. Uh, uh, largely automated fabrication systems uh, <coughs> with a variety of superconducting and other, other materials. Uh, we have a sub-micrometer lithography, o optical down to about half a micron, and then we can use electron beam lithography for, for going to deep sub-micrometer structures if that is needed for, 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 for some applications. And of course, you need to say it's not just about the devices. We need to do the engineering around it, so we have a plenty of, of uh, activities in electronics in also we, we often start ourselves also from from device physics we do the cryogenic uh, engineering to an extent ourselves or at least uh, or now that things are coming more commercially available do the build the setups measurement setups inside the like blue force cryostats like this is from from our the blue force cryostats from our basement basement um but then uh, a little bit about the project activity. So <coughs> we are funded in, at VTT by public and private sources. But now the, in quantum side, we were quite successful in this quantum flagship, which is now, <coughs> now in the ramp up phase with a uh, uh, total European budget of 130 million. And we actually managed to secure something like 2.6 million <coughs> to VTT. We have three ongoing going projects. Then uh, Mick already mentioned we are part of this Academy of Finland Center of Excellence. We have some uh, <coughs> uh, foundation funding, and now this, as this industrial <coughs> interest is growing, also a little bit. We are uh, David also mentioned that we are building this uh, Finnish ecosystem project, uh, quantum technologies industrial, with, with private private companies uh, here. So what we are doing in, in this exactly this quantum computing, so a few main, <coughs> main roles is that uh, 
<laughs> in superconducting quantum computing is that we are doing sort of this uh, integration platform for quantum processor. These are done part of this European Open SuperQ project and also with our other partners. So partners, so we are trying to <coughs> not so much do the qubits ourselves. We have done that also, but to provide something to build the computer on. And uh, then you can also think of why is it difficult to build a quantum computer? Okay, may maybe many reasons, but uh, given the state of art uh, today, it's not actually that <coughs> quantum processor <coughs> with today's scaling wouldn't be that uh, <coughs> that um, complex circuit, but it's about that uh, in order to preserve the quantum coherence, it's very limited what you can do, and you have to do it in a very smart way. So uh, <coughs> 100 qubit processor would be a few hundred just as on junctions, and that's not a problem at all. But what's difficult is that uh, you cannot mess up with things. So uh, if you have, uh, this uh, shows, for example, a microwave resonator, that is a part of uh, practical <coughs> superconducting quantum computer. So if uh, here, here is this sort of plain, plain resonator structure. This quality factor tells how good it is in terms of losses. So it doesn't have coupled to a lossy environment and thus kill the quantum coherence. If you start putting materials that are typically used in IC fabrication, you collapse the quality factor and uh, then s uh, your quantum computer doesn't work or works very poorly. So that's why it's very important how you do, do it. Uh, we are, one approach for this is, th uh, is that <coughs> we do this 3D integration uh, by routing signals through the wafer. We are doing also inter uh, chip connections between chips to have this lossy environment a little bit further away from the qubit system that, <coughs> that needs to be on the pristine, pristine <coughs> surface. So building a quantum computer is really not just spreading around these rusty pieces of aluminum, but it's also keeping the things clean. So, uh, sorry? Uh, well, the qubits are typically coupled to these mi microwave resonant structures that form this part of this quantum circuit. So they are needed for readout. They are needed for uh, coupling the qubit to the um, environment. It's part of the quantum system is this passive uh, microwave resonator. Uh, well, they are okay. So they are controlled by microwave. Uh, <coughs> microwave pulses that go through this resonant circuitry, uh, the, the nonlinearity comes from the qubit, that, uh, from the Josephson junction that is needed for operating the qubit. So it's, um, it's basically all microwave te technology, how, how you operate the uh, qubits. <laughs> so you basically don't need, uh, maybe in some cases you need some DC tuning parameters, or uh, it's just a pure, pure microwave technology where these uh, microwave frequencies correspond to the energy differences of, of the different states of the quantum quantum computer. Okay, then I'm talking a little bit about physics. <coughs> so one topic where we are active, quite active here is, is as, I, as I said, it, the <coughs> this comes down to the reading of the microwave signals from the, from the qubits. But, uh, uh, parametric amplification is, is uh, for example, changing the length of the pendulum at the right frequency and phase, and there uh, we have an implementation of a parametric amplifier. Um, so, uh, but we don't use that directly, but uh, we change this one, uh, use this so-called <coughs> microwave parametric amplifier. So, you pu uh, <coughs> for the readout of the qubit set, for example, you need to amplify it before sending the data to, to room temperature for, for processing. So um, <coughs> in this case, not the physical length of the, uh, here you see a mi microwave uh, transmission line. We don't change the physical length of it, but we change the uh, pump the, through the nonlinearity in <coughs> Josephson junctions. We pump the effective wavelength or, uh, of the, microwave 
propagating in that line and by that same effect we get more power in than what went out than what went in and this is a uh, <coughs> common way or this is the best known way of, of doing the readout of a qubit state. So these parametric amplifiers and couplers we are involved in do, doing in, a, in a national and European projects. Um, so these are a few devices from us. So the aim is to have very low noise amplifiers. Ideally we are aiming at having just the quantum fundamental uh, uncertainty coming from <coughs> nature, the quantum fluctuation to be there. But here is, for example, a device with 0.1 Kelvin noise temperature, whereas the best cool semiconductor amplifiers give about a 2 Kelvin. Ke now, m now the temperature measuring the added noise by the amplifier or room temperature amplifiers may be having uh, a tens of Kelvin up to 200 Kelvin, depending slightly on the frequency. And uh, not only amplifiers, but we are also involved in the <coughs> project where this uh, Par parametric effects are used for quantum state teleportation, for example, um, in, in, in microwave com quantum co communication. And uh, okay, then um, something about this uh, <coughs> thermal engineering. Um, so somehow uh, a dream would be that you would have these integrated coolers. This is actually done by Mika Brunilas group uh, here at VDT. So, um, uh, the thing is about, <coughs> uh, I like agreeably, the development of cryogenics has been very helpful for us because they are now much more compact. But of course, if you would, li the dream is that you would like to go from this uh, cascade, uh, <coughs> integrated cascade of coolers uh <coughs> down to these maybe millikelvin levels. So there. Uh, there's work on, on these um, <coughs> integrated coolers uh, where, let's say, you, you use this effect called thermionic en emission, well-known effect, but uh, in addition you do this uh, materials and uh, nan nanostructure uh, optimization to prevent from the leakage of the heat by phonons out of the structure and uh, this is uh, something that there has been uh, working prototypes demonstrated based on the semiconductor superconductor junctions in this time and uh, um, the recipes to cooling from 1.5 kelvin to 100, 100 millikelvin have been developed by Mikas uh, group and um, uh, the uh, of course it's not quite there yet and it's a long way to go but um, <coughs> this would certainly enable to do things in a much more compact way if this if this uh, goes forward. Um, and also now I'm deviating a little bit from my topic. I also mentioned that men we have these different fabrication platforms, one of being this uh, CMOS active semiconductor device platform. So Mika's team is also working on, on this um, 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 uh, nano CMOS platform now mainly aimed for the low temperature uh, slash quantum applications. So this is a custom example of how we can do these customized process flows for specific uh, applications. Here you see, for example, this judge dynamics on this uh, nanoscale um, transistor, single electron transistor mode. This can be used, for example, in, in, in spin <coughs> quantum computing. And uh, this is also very much ongoing development. Um, OK, so this was all for today. So I, I would like to thank you for your attention. And, uh,